Hello, 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 and welcome to Rainbows Rising, where we ascend together. I'm your host, Rainbow Raja, and today I'm going to give a theorized history and background to multiple subgroups of uh, that, that use light language. And I'm also going to be providing a light language reading at the end to give you a forecast for what to expect for the rest of this month. So we talked a little bit about light language last week, and I really wanted to dive a little deeper into where this term light language comes from and the different cultures and different beliefs that have uh, developed through the theories and channelings that are coming through. So there seems to be quite a lot of different variations of origins for light language. The the information I was able to find is that light language, the actual term light language, began with the shamans of the Mayan culture and that tradition of ch- channeling or being a vessel for this light language has been passed down by these ancient teachers to the shamans of Veracruz, Mexico. This intuitive language gave them the ability to internalize the reality they wished for themselves and their community using sacred geometry and colors and symbolism. And this also allowed them to communicate their intentions through their heart. Uh, And that meant that all of the work that they were doing was always love-based and filled with gratitude for the universe and for the sources of this energy. I'm not really sure if these ancient findings of the Mayans seem to be the groundwork for the more modern practitioners of light language, but I definitely think that uh, maybe the the term itself, light language, may have been coined from the Mayans. Um, and now these these modern practitioners are expanding uh, the histories and origins of light language based on information they're receiving in their channelings with, with this, this energy, uh, with this language. And this is where I'm going to break up into like five groups that are completely different in their beliefs. The first group I'm going to call the star seeds or star children, and they believe that their souls have incarnated here on earth to inspire and heal humans in preparation for planetary ascension. Some use light language as an extension of their own soul's healing abilities, and some claim they channel guides or collectives off-world, whether they be in, like, spacecrafts or even, like, all the way into their star systems. Um, The most common known alien collectives that are being channeled are the Pleiadians, the Lyrans, the Arcturians, the Orions, or Orions, Draconians, and Syrians. Um, Of these collectives, each have their own offerings and gifts and blessings that they are presenting in their transmissions. Many of these light language channelers are actually sharing what they believe their starseed lineage or origin to be um, on their channels, whether it be YouTube or podcasts or otherwise. And it is super common to find people who resonate with multiple starseed origins. For example, I really resonate with like Pleiadians and Lyrans um, and... Polarians, which I didn't cover their smaller group. So the second group I want to talk about is there's a large group of people that believe their light language actually stems from the lost continent of Mu or Lemuria and Atlantis. Now, the difference between Lemurians and Atlanteans is Lemurians focused on the connection 
to the planet using natural technologies like working with animals and using herbs and crystals and healing. Uh, and and they, they had learned how to use healing facilitated through the energy systems within the body to a really advanced degree. Um, whereas Atlanteans used more of the mechanical technologies and focused on harnessing energy to further society and technology kind of work on more of the like structure of things. Some believe that these societies destroyed each other. Others believe that they merely relocated the continent to avoid contact with, well, <laughs> uh, underdeveloped civilizations. Uh, at this time, like this was like 12,000 years ago, mankind was not that developed and they probably did not want to be discovered with people were just kind of conquering nations and, you know, trying to discover new lands. So that that's a possibility. But it is much more scientifically accepted that the island collapsed. Now, remember, this is a theory. This is not proven. This is a scientific theory about the lost continent of Mu. That the island collapsed into the sea due to the continent being mainly made of granite. And, you know, when you have granite and you have high temperatures of submarine volcanic masses that are uh, releasing a lot of high temperature, highly explosive gases, it can erode the, the granite, creating more of like a honeycomb base. And um, over time, this created a lot of pockets of these highly explosive gases. And if there was a volcanic eruption, it would have literally created a, a landmine of a bunch of different explosions, just kind of causing the entire island to degrade and collapse into the Indian Ocean. And Lemuria and Atlantis, Atlantis would have been lost to the sea. Now, the Lemurians and Atlanteans that are channeling light language, they wish to impart the wisdom and knowledge of their culture from uh, the remembrance of past lives or either transferred through um, seed crystals, uh, which, which are crystals that hold information and intelligence from their cultures um or they they also want to help give insight to what they see as weaknesses from their society so that we don't make the same mistakes that might lead to our demise as well um moving on to another much smaller group of light language speakers who believe that the language they speak are fae in nature or that they believe they're fairies or reincarnated fairies. Um, now, when I refer to fairies or fae, I'm referring to like any fairy tale mythical fantasy like beings such as dragons, unicorns, kelpies, elves, gnomes, pixies. Uh, there's there's literally thousands of them. <laughs> I've studied a lot of them. I, I like I like fairies a lot. So their light language is used to actually raise the collective container for physical application of the elemental magics. Now humans have a limited gauge on how much magic our body can actually funnel through our energetic circuits. And these fey humans, as I'm going to call them, are helping to raise the bar as to what we can potentially do with our bodies and our energetic fields um, through these new downloads that they are sharing with us. And, you know, I, I kind of am hoping that this, this is, this is true because I would see this as a blessing and a huge wish come true for so many humans that are wanting magic so bad. I mean, we got Harry Potter, we got Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I mean, that would be so cool, um, if these transmissions were actually able to raise, our ability to contain more elemental magics and uh, make it potential to use magic in a physical way. Um, so 
There's there's another small group of light language healers that believe that they are earth angels or angels incarnated here to heal and guide and support the expansion of consciousness and human evolution. Um, these people in the subgroup usually are channeling like Archangel Michael or Gabriel or they they might be actually connecting in with those angelic energies in that way. Um, they, they usually will talk about having big wings or energetic wings that they, that they use for healing, or, um, they will talk about their ideas of, you know, wanting to be able to fly or dreaming of flying often or enjoying activities that feel like flying. These people also seem to have really amazing luck at avoiding uh, devastating situations that could have resulted in injury, death, or a super traumatic experience where, you know, people they know might be like, wow, you got a guardian angel or somebody was really looking out for you. So these people are also super empathic and have a tendency of, of, giving away too much uh, love and no matter how much battering they go through, they, they uh, really, they really just, they, they just keep on loving, keep on trekking. So the very last group I want to talk about are shamans. Now I know I started with talking about how the term light language was first introduced by Mayan shamans, but shamans in general have always been a channel for interdimensional or other dimensional beings. In ancient shamanic cultures across the globe, light language or spirit language as it was most commonly known at the time was an innate language that was believed to be known and understood by all living beings in their hearts. Spirit languages have been documented by anthropologists to be used by shamans for thousands of years, like over a hundred thousand years. Now, in these ancient shamanic cultures, uh, spirit language was a way to communicate with spirits that were interacting and also sometimes interfering with human life, as well as it was a way that shamans could work with their spirit helpers and bring medicine from the etheric or astral realms into the physical plane for healing and to invite changes to the land, such as helping crops grow in the community for helping with harmony and helping kind of mitigate any interpersonal issues among the community, as well as in the self, uh, helping others with their healing, helping oneself with their healing and development and learning new skills. And spirit language could be used to communicate with animals, to discern messages. Um, a lot of shamanic cultures believed that these animals would bring messages from the gods or goddesses. And this was most commonly seen in Norse, pagan, N Native American, or indigenous cultures. Spirit language was also used to ask animals to follow specific tasks. A good example of this would be going up to beaver, having this spirit language communication with beaver, asking beaver to build a dam to facilitate a an easier fishing spot and secure more food for the village. So spirit language was an active part in providing food and crop and shelter, as well as worship and incantation magics, even in other cultures such as Egyptian cultures, African cultures, South American, Siberian, Australian, and I'm sure a whole bunch more. But those are the ones I know of. Shamans were able to use these languages because uh, they are known to be the bridge between the unseen worlds. The word shaman is originally a Siberian word from the Tungus tribe, which means one who knows. Shamans were recognized across every known continent as bridges to the spirit world, 
and were honored as medicine people and counselors to their entire communities. What set these shamans apart from any other intuitive member of that society was their ability to drop into an altered state of awareness easily, without much effort, and communicate with these other dimensional beings. In these ancient cultures, shamans would work with these spirits and ancestors in the astral realm or etheric realm to bring about physical healing and physical shifts in the third dimensional plane. When they were doing this work, they would journey to the astral plane. They would then speak to the spirit using light language, or they would bring the medicine to the sick person in the third dimensional plane through singing in light language or using medicine songs or chanting in, med you know, uh, the, the light language or spirit language. And the shamans were known to be able to tap into any of the above subgroups and communicate with their ancestors and anyone who is deceased using these spirit languages. Shamans tend to view light language as our soul's origin language. That through emotion, intention, vibration, and sound, physical matter can be altered and healing can be inspired and information can be bestowed. And in this way, this group, the group that I feel most uh, connection to, has grown to be able to accept all of the above theories and allows all of their beliefs to be valid because they can communicate with all those subgroups and can see the bigger picture. So even though it seems like there's a lot going on and you don't really know which ones are real or which ones are not, and some may sound silly to some of you out there, whatnot, um, my personal experience with light language and knowing quite a few people who learned light language either on their own, just one day being able to do it out of the blue, or uh, being attuned to it, or experiencing it from another, um, I, I realize that I like, I like all of these options, and I believe that they all are true. Through my personal experiences, and hearing everyone's opinions and their experience of light language. And this may be based in my core values, uh, but my core values are that we build our reality. We are all individuals with individual perspectives of our realities. And that through our experience, we are manifesting and creating what we wish to experience through this life. So, for example, if one of us believes in angels and... Uh, Angels will become an important piece of their reality, their ability to identify with themselves, and a piece of their puzzle to better understanding the world in which they live. And when I work with someone who believes in angels, I'm obviously going to have to work with their guides, which are going to be angels, or when working on them for their past lives, I'm going to experience whatever past lives they have, which if they believe they're an angel, most likely will be that. Um, and they don't have to describe this to me if it's something that they have internalized, if it's something they wish or feel at the core of their being. That's just what's true. That's just what's true. And I've worked with Pleiadian guides, despite at the time not really being on this whole alien, tr you know, I, I, I was really skeptical of this alien thing. But I've worked with Pleiadian guides and Lyran guides and fairies and my own angelic self. I've checked out my past life Lemurian self. And I've worked with clients and colleagues, and there are just so, so many people who have personal experiences. And that's really the only way you can experience light language and understand its depth and its value 
is through experience, through exploration and questioning and diving deeper and really trying to best understand where this fits in your in your life. I know that when I'm in flow with light language or I'm receiving it from somebody else, it's 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 unbelievably tangible. It is a sensory rich experience that has preceded huge life changing events and successes in my life. I deeply, deeply believe that despite how odd or bizarre or even triggering some of these transmissions may seem at times, that they somehow bring parts of myself that need attention, healing, and release to to the surface. And they also open doors to opportunities that I didn't even know were available in a completely indescribable way. Three years ago, if somebody had told me that I would have met a gal who would have done a, you know, super beautiful session that mostly was singing and a singing bowl, uh, and somehow that would have changed my life, I would not have believed you. I would have been like, that sounds ridiculous. But... It did. Somehow, connecting to light language, connecting to this flow of information and sounds and what, you know, what, whatever this is, uh, that this has changed the actual events in my life. I got clients. I found a way of integrating my practice. Um, I had all these different services that, you know, for the most part I was, I was doing in different blocks and light language really helped me be able to integrate them all in one type of session. I wasn't just doing massage um, and then doing a segment of Reiki and then doing a segment of crystal therapy. No, 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 no. It, the information that came through to me was vital for me to learn how to integrate those things so that I was actually providing all of those experiences into one session, into one experience. Had I not been able to use light language, I would not have the private practice that I do and the success that I do. I acquired enough clients that saw immediate and drastic results in their sessions uh, that I was able to open a second office and even expand to a different state and do online work and be able to offer healings in a, a virtual way. So it changed my life. It changed how I interacted with people and how I did my own healing for myself and even with my children. So that is... Uh, that was the breakdown of light language history and a little bit of the research that I've done and my experience with um, people in these communities and what they have to say about it. Uh, I would love to know what you guys think. Do any of you speak light language? Or, you know, do you have a problem with light language? I'd love to hear about that too. I, I'm super interested in what you guys have to say. So go ahead, send me an email, write me a review, and I will go straight on into a reading. Get ready. This reading is going to outline the rest of January for you. So I am going to be using the Beyond Lemuria Oracle deck made by Izzy Ivy. Now, um, 
The way I'm going to be doing today's reading is I'm just going to allow whatever cards are for your highest and best good to come out. And I would like you all to select a number between one and three. And uh, whatever number of cards comes out will be part of your reading. So go ahead and pick your numbers while I shuffle. And during your, your reading or right after your reading, I will be doing an activation to help you connect to your personal, uh, personal messages and help you connect with the ability to utilize light language yourself. Now, if you're not interested in doing any light language or you're like, you know, I don't really care to use it or learn it. You can go ahead and set the intention that you are not open to receiving uh, the activation for learning light language. And that's totally fine. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and shuffle up and pause, pause this so that uh, I can set up the reading for you guys. Each of the readings came out with two cards. The first card is the core energy, uh, the, the baseline energy. And the second card is more of like what will support this energy through the rest of the month. So reading number one, we have the element of fire. Fire is all about passion and creation uh, and in this card, we have this woman who is meditating, um, and out of her stems these, these dragons. There's a dark dragon and there's a light dragon and they are spiraling together up into the sunlight. Um, so that's a lot of dualistic, uh, symbolism there with the dark and the light and the weaving. And it's about beginning to accept uh, parts of yourself that maybe you weren't so so fond of or maybe these are these are ways of incorporating your weaknesses or your flaws as strengths um, and right below this woman there is um, kind of the seed of creation we have we have the little baby in the womb um, so this can, can technically mean that you are about to create something, that this is creation energy. This is about you feeling strong in your ability to, to bring forth your wishes, your visions into this material plane. Um, this card also, I get like a lot of Phoenix energy from it as, as you know, the symbolism of fire normally does bring, and um, a kundalini awakening, and this is this is a really beautiful card of surrendering and releasing expectations that that come from the creation process. It's really just giving in to your body's um, innate ability to create and trusting in the process. Um, I wish I could share the visuals. It's absolutely beautiful, beautiful card. The second card, which like I said, the second card is more of like an action or, um, what this energy is supporting. And this card is unique gifts. This card is letting you know that you are about to rediscover some aspects of yourself. We are all individuals. We all have beautiful different gifts and abilities and blessings that have been bestowed upon us by our ancestors and our guides and our higher self. And this is a time of rediscovering these gifts and awakening to the information these gifts are, are going to provide you. So the way that these cards are oriented is this, this kundalini fire card is actually feeding energy down into this unique gifts card where this little 
cute blue being which gives off a super calm and peaceful and very full of self-acceptance vibe uh, with a beautiful fireball in her solar plexus. So the solar plexus is the chakra of fire. It's about um, our confidence and moving forward in life. So I feel like there is a lot of fire energy for you this month, a lot of re-recognizing your inner power, your inner abilities, and maybe coming into your own gifts, your own creative abilities, and, and rediscovering things about yourself. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and hold these cards and give you an activation that will help you better channel this, uh, the, the light language that you are meant to channel, that you are meant to connect with, okay? Anju acho a tu hutum, he my tosh, he polo in a hep, yon yo hen, he polo in juam, yan love to know how that was received. Moving on to reading number two. Reading number two, your base energy, the fundamental energy vibration you're going to be working on in the next two weeks is loving compassion. Loving compassion. Now, loving compassion um, is really about having the grace and the patience with yourself and with others and recognizing that we're all human, that we're flawed, and that you can just really find forgiveness and acceptance for yourself, the people in your life, and even life circumstances that come your way. Um, Loving compassion is mostly unconditional love. 
And I know that's like a heavy term to use, but it really is recognizing that your flaws are some of the most beautiful pieces of you. They really are. And that that acceptance and that love and gentle compassion for yourself, for your mistakes, for your imperfections, can transform the way you are moving through your life. And your helping energy or your action energy is furred and feathered friends. And in this card, you know, we have a lot of animals. There's like lion and antelope and sloth and snake and fennec fox and rabbit. And you got hummingbird and rooster and snail and butterflies and eagle. There's and fish. There's all kinds of little animals here. And this, uh, the being in the middle is raising her arms up in unison with all these animals that are sitting so peacefully next to her. None of them are trying to eat each other, which, you know, you'd think with a lion and a bunny next to each other, then that would be a problem. But it looks like she's completely in balance with the world and life. And I feel like this card is a call to action to get back out in nature and to connect with animals and animal spirits. So start recognizing any animals or any repetitive animal patterns that are coming to you. I did do an episode on totems. So if you haven't uh, listened to those uh, episodes on spirit animals or animal totems, please go ahead and, and give those a listen if you're not familiar with how to work with animal spirits and receive messages from the animals in that way. But this is a call to begin to maybe feel that loving compassion for yourself that you would towards animals or to extend your love to the environment, to the animal kingdom, and help yourself learn vital lessons and important lessons for your soul through the collaboration of working with the animals. So to help you integrate this, this energy and to be able to find your own light language that you can connect with, maybe you're meant to use light language to work with animals. We will see. I'm going to go ahead and give you the activation. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so that was your transmission. And we're going to move on to the third and final reading. We have Mount Shasta as your your baseline energy. Now, Mount Shasta is, in California, it is considered one of the seven chakras of the world. Originally, it was supposed to be the root chakra of the world, but the last time I was there, it definitely felt like it was more of the the uh, crown chakra and I was uh, talking with a local there who channels light language and she definitely believes that Mount Shasta is in the process of switching its polarities on the earth chakra um, grid, I guess. So Mount Shasta is really important because it is a highly activated spiritual center that that does incorporate a lot of light codes there is said to be a large collective of uh lemurians that are living in a city called telos and so this is all about connecting to these light codes of the land connecting into the the grid lines of energy that that are in all things. I feel like this particular card for you guys is um, recognizing the connections and the secret messages encoded in uh, stargazing and in specific geographic places that you visit or are visiting and to really sit in these places that feel special maybe go out over the next few weeks and connect to these these places um you might have dreams of specific places or maybe you feel very strongly about about a tree that's in your front yard and just go and spend some time underneath this tree give yourself the permission to be open to receiving any information or light codes that come in. Um, you can even just sit and if you feel inclined to try light language, try some light language, try connecting with the land through light language, and that that will help. And the second card, which is more of your action, your helper 
card is called Stepping Through. Now, Stepping Through is a, a card that's about being in flow with the energies that are around you. It's about not getting in your way. And there's a lot of times that we're sitting and doing practices, whether it be meditation or uh, trying to do light language or using pendulums or crystals where we second guess ourselves. This card is asking you to step through your own self-criticism, to step through that layer of judgment and just allow what is coming through to be. Be this, this open open flow for these energies, these messages to come through you. See yourself as a river. See yourself as as this uh, interwoven piece of the fabric of life. So this particular combination of Mount Shasta where we're connecting into the ley lines of the land and also the light codes from the stars and from connecting with our planet and the galactic energies of of like sitting outside and staring at stars and allowing this information to come through and not doubting yourself not judging yourself just really observing it coming through and feeling it and being with it trust what comes through. So if you are interested in trying light language, just sit and be open to allowing whatever is coming through to come through, no matter what sound it is, no matter what it looks like, or, you know, whatever you you are perceiving it to be. When I first started channeling light language, it was just a bunch of gibberish. It was like, like it, it made no sense. It didn't have any kind of form or prettiness and it was to help me break down my filters and to break down my inhibitions and my self-judgments and self-criticism so allow that through I'm going to go ahead and give you your activation Shanjo to a dan dai to a to 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 a tan dan dai nuam. Iashwala ku a moluan jan. Jemaeto hiu. Yamahe amato. Nahemo kolo kunj en jan juhum dua. Lae sho sho anja man nae tan chu chu am palaetan he molo kinjam. Hey, 
e tātai tua, mō chua, he chua chua chua, he po chua, he tua. All right, so I hope everyone enjoyed your reading and your activation for today. And I'm hoping that that history of light language filled in any questions or uh, any kind of information you may have had or uh, helped better understand what light language is and where it came from and why there's this big fascination about it. Um, and I want to remind everybody that we will have Nalini on by the end of the month. She is a wonderful light language artist and channeler. And, uh, I expect to have a really wonderful interview with her. So please stay tuned to the end of the month to hear that interview. Thank you all so much for tuning in. It is such a pleasure to be able to uh, share my passions with you, to share my information, my wisdom, and um, to be able to be challenged to look more into these subjects uh, and uh, explore with you and to uh, ascend together, right? I hope you guys have a wonderful week and I'll see you next week.
Are you ready to ascend to the next level? This is Rainbow Raja, your spirit guide calling. Please be sure to keep all arms and legs inside your vessel at all times. I'm just here to remind you to take some time today. Support Rainbow's Rising podcast. Go join the Discord community. Check out the Patreon. Get some stickers, custom tarot cards. Check out the merch. The merch. You know you want to. Go connect with Rainbow Raja. Maybe even get a session. Who knows? Your support helps make this show possible. And she loves to support you. Help support her too. Once again, this is Rainbow Raja, your spirit guide guiding you to your ascension.